PSA State of the Party's briefing uh, for the party conferences. So um, we would appreciate feedback on whether you find this useful um, and how if we do it again next year, we, we, we might adjust it. Um, I have to apologise that unfortunately Tim Dale didn't come today, he's not well. So, um, but he has written a summary which is in the hat. Um, as usual, uh, we'll, we'll send out everything to you in the comment form later today, and it will also be out on the website. Um, I think we're going to start with John, <laughs> <laughs> if that's okay, yeah. just to get the overview. Right. Um, okay, so I'm just going to talk very briefly about the state of the electoral battle. Primarily focusing on Labour and the Tories, so kind of live down parenthetically. Um, first of all, just to remind you, this is uh, a little series of uh, average polling ratings that I do based on the basis of YouGov, uh, Ipsos, Mori, uh, and Tomlin, so the four companies who keep on doing the same thing month after month. Um, and just to remind you that certainly hitherto there have been two important breaks in the series and that we now may be looking at a third. Uh, the first of course was back in the autumn of 2010 when the Liberal Democrats no dark nose died in the way of the tuition fees the Oscar, and the Labour Party emerged ahead for the first time in this parliament. Um, Cameron's veto proved to be a blip, not a permanent change. The second development was in the spring of 2012 in the wake of George Osborne's uh, capacity tax and caravan tax and charities tax and the inability of the Home Secretary to cut family days of around three months, which had a very clear, very quite substantial and dramatic impact on Tory fortunes, from which the two may not really recover. The third, and one of the things I don't want to talk about, is now it's certainly more than temporary, though how long it will go to see, is that during the course of the summer, or really frankly between the winter and the summer, uh, Labour's rating has gone back down again, and now it looks more than this uh, robust than it once did. Um, of course, against this backdrop of the three Westminster parties has been the intervention of UKIP into British politics. Uh, on a substantial scale, but basically starting at around the time of the Omni Shovels uh, 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 events of spring 2012, rising throughout the course of uh, the 12 months through the local elections in May when the UK did that uh, height of 15%. They've fallen back, and they've not fallen back that far. Um, if I told you 12 months ago that UK would stand at 11 percent in 12 months' time, you probably wouldn't have believed me. Um, so it's worth remembering how substantial this is. In this case, an important development that I'm going to come back to. Now, um, let me then kind of turn quickly, first of all, um, to the Labour Party, given that it most recently seems to have hit a bit of trouble. Um, one little exercise I, I did a couple of weeks ago was to look at the position of the principal opposition party in each parliament that lasted more or less for four or five years, and therefore. I looked at the position at something like 21, 22 months out from what proved to be polling day. Um, and looked to see uh, where was the opposition at that point, uh, where does the Labour Party position start uh, compare and contrast to get some uh, a feeling, well, you know, is a five or six point lead, which is what the Labour Party are currently enjoying, uh, now rather well diminished uh, since the winter when it's standing about 10 or 11. You know, is that quote adequate, unquote? Always bearing in mind that the stock of presses have ever broken. And the answer pretty clearly is not. I mean, the first thing to say is oppositions are usually in the lead. William Hague takes the record for being the one opposition leader incapable of putting his party in the lead on any consistent basis while he was up while he was in opposition. But if you will notice that the occasions on which the opposition went on to win, December 62, that's uh, before the 64 election, 68, the Tories before 1970, let's um, come, we'll come up 1972, uh, the Tories in July 77, 16 points, then we come to Tony Blair, of course it was miles ahead, but equally David Cameron was also a long way ahead. So the truth is that no opposition 
with a lead as narrow as this at this stage in the Parliament has managed to go on a minority. The best that can be said is that in May 1972, the Labour Party was only about six points ahead, uh, and of course the election of February 74, they got a minority, became a minority government, they held the second election, and we didn't really do the trick either. So um, that gives you some indication of the degree to which, in fact, certainly if the Labour Party is now going to go on to win the election, it is going to have to basically break historical precedent. Um, of course, during the summer, I mean, the decline in nervous poll rating, I mean, quite clearly uh, resulted in some amount of nervousness on their party. The second reason for nervousness is in the balance of ratings. And, um, you know, basically, he's gone, he's gone back to ground zero. In fact, if anything, I mean, these are Maurice's. I mean, of the various series, Maurice is the one I prefer because they ask people whether you are satisfied or dissatisfed. Uh, you govern Congress ask questions like, do you think Edmund Bell is being a good leader? Well, I might be quite satisfied with Edmund Bell, but I might think he's screwing things up at the moment as far as the media to tell me. And you tend to get much more negative evaluations of those questions. Um, but even on this version, actually the most recent poll reading was the worst, um, and Edmund Bell has clearly gone backwards. So we can argue about what's cause and what's in effect. But clearly, again, if you do the similar exercise to this one, then you can't do it quite so cleanly because uh, there isn't one time so you can like that over time. But if you can splice various series together, there is one there is one <coughs> beacon of hope for Edward Bell. And the beacon of hope is Edward Heath. Edward Heath is the one opposition uh, leader who uh, went on to become Prime Minister for the first time, who was in the kind of negative territory that Edward Bell is currently in. Though as you will have seen, however, his party was doing all the better uh, at the same time. Um, but otherwise, again, opposition leaders that are uh, in the kind of territory that they're in is, have not gone on to become prime minister. So you can see why uh, there is this um, nervousness. Now that said, and I know that Mike, Mike Smithson has been tweeting about this in recent days, I'm going to remind you of something that I said back in April, which is that although the Labour Party may spend its life criticising what the government, uh, what the Tories are doing, actually, the real enemies are not the people, uh, mostly the ministers on the front bench who be in front of them, but those down, slightly down the gangway, i.e. Uh, the Lib Dems. A third of 2010 Lib Dem voters are continuing to say they would Labour. And if you do the maths in these, in, in these polls, and you kind of say, well, what would happen if these, oh, sorry, if these folk uh, did not, uh, were not switching to their party, the Labour League disappears. So, um, the it, so long as the Lib Dems remain in trouble, the Lib Dems are now three years long in trouble, uh, the Labour Party's uh, poll, poll position may not go down any further, and that together with the electoral system may be enough to drive the Labour Party past the winning one. But it's very, very much dependent on the weakness of the Lib Dems and also the problems of the Tories onto which I will now come. Now, one of the things again to be picked up in the movie music quite correctly is that on a variety of measures, um, we wouldn't want to say that the public uproar is optimistic, um, but uh, however you measure it, the so called field of the factor is now more optimistic than at any time it has been since uh, May 2010. You can see that in UGAR's data, you can see it in Ipsos Mori's data. Uh, the crucial question, however, is whether or not this economic improvement is necessarily going to translate into enhanced votes for the Conservatives as they seem to be inclined to, uh, to presume. Now, one thing that certainly needs to be true is that if you are going to, to turn economic optimism into political success, you need to use it to try and persuade people that you are actually doing the job running, running the economy. And as you can see, uh, that was something that kept on uh, declining uh, in the early years of coalition, but again, particularly with a marked decline in the spring of 2012, at the right time, George Osborne's budget, which clearly did damage to their reputation for economic confidence. Now, I find a question whether you think the glass is half full or half, or half empty. There is some evidence here that the Tory, uh, and I'm assuming that for, for most people, although this says coalition is the Tory, doesn't matter. So there's some evidence here that, that the Tory reputation may be being restored to some degree. Um, and certainly the, the, the very low depths to which it fell in the summer of 2012 and again earlier this year have been recovered from. And indeed, in fact, actually, 
The current standing of, of, on this rotation is back more or less to where it was before the crash of spring 2012. So to that extent, it may sound arguably, yes, maybe it is big, it, 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 um, economic optimism is being translated into perceptions of how the economy is running. However, what you also discover, well, first of all, just to remind you, if you go back to uh, where we are here, the Tories before the spring budget were weighing around 36, 37 months. They were essentially holding the vote that they had in the 2010 election. They are not as yet back in that level. So that raises the question. Um, that certainly that as yet, even on this measure, has not as yet fully translated, it seems, into Tory recovery. The second thing to take in mind, bear in mind is that, of course, the problem that the Tories face is not a bunch of people who've gone going off to no party because they've lost confidence in the ability of the Conservatives to win the economy and they think their party can do a better job because we know people who don't think their party can do a better job. What they did was to go wandering off the UK. And at the moment, at least, here, here I'm taking the average defection rate of 2000 Tories, uh, sorry, 2010 Tories, Labour, and Democrat voters to um, at UK. And you know, as you all know, it's predominantly ex Tory voters who are going. But crucially, as yet at least, on average, according to the opinion polls, the Tories have not made any progress in deflating the level of defection from Tory to UK. Here I'm comparing April, so it's just before the elections, um, with the position in August. I think the question that therefore arises is, well, it may well be true that uh, the initial trigger for the Tories' electoral difficulties was on the shambles of concern about the economy. But having been shaken off the Tory perch, these folk have now found another perch, which some of them seem to find quite congenial, including quite congenial ideologically. So the question is, however, will economic recovery be sufficient to shake these folk back onto the Tory perch or not? And I think that remains an open question. So my conclusion out of all of this is look forward to a jolly pessimistic conference season because frankly I don't think any of the Westminster parties have very much to shout about. Um, the Tories must worry about whether how they can get those voters back from UKIP. It's not necessarily clear that George Osborne saying the economy is doing wonderfully um, is necessarily going to be sufficient. Well, they probably have to worry because it isn't clear that they've got the kind of lead that they should have. They're going to be confident of victory. The Lib Dems are just still in absolute, frankly, disastrous position. Um, and it's you, at all the conferences, it's you, given the facts I've mostly happy about. The balloon is deflated a little since the local elections, but it certainly ain't burst yet, and unless it does burst, um, the Tories are probably going to struggle to get anywhere close to their aspirations of winning the next election. Thank you. Um, now, Matt, Matt Beach, who is a newcomer to these three things, he's <laughs> um, going to talk about Labour. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, good morning everyone. Um, so John has given us a number of analysis to go with the number of time, hoping to uh, bring something quite different and look at the nature of the parties, uh, policy ideas and, and leadership. I'll start with the Liberals. I mean I think I think it's fairly a fairly established point in contemporary political commentary that uh, Nick Clegg's leadership has gone down uh, rather less well with his activists um, than, than with some of his, with some of his um, MPs. <coughs> I, think, I, I think the most important thing to say about the business and leadership is um, I, I really do feel that it is secure. I, mean, it's, it's, I don't think it's popular, but I think it's secure until the outcome of the 2015 general election. Um, several liberal activists that I've spoken to at various levels and at various positions in the party have said to me that they feel that uh, Tim Farron perhaps will attempt to challenge uh, after the next general election. That will be, we'll, we will wait and see. But I think as far as leadership in terms of the Liberals go, I think that you know, it is a fair bet to say that Nick Clegg's leadership is secure. Um, I mean, after all, who would want to try and seek him now? And uh, what, 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 what an election it's going to be. Uh, uh, I think John's right. I think the, 
the liberals are staring down. Not oblivion, because I think there is something about the liberals that people often uh, ignore, which is once they win a seat, they, they are immensely good from community <coughs> politics upwards at holding on to that seat. I think the great problem for them does pertain to numbers, which is the fact that they are now at 42,000 members, which is, which is, even for them, that's paltry, which means fewer foot soldiers, not just to hold on to those seats that they have, and some of them, uh, you have wafer thin majorities, but also in terms of the offensive attacking aspect of uh, political campaigning. In, in other words, targeting the seats they need that they feel they have a chance at. So I think that is uh, a real issue in terms of party organisation. A very, very difficult 18 months lie ahead of them uh, because of that. And I think mean also there is, there is an ongoing discussion in the Liberal Democrats uh, about the state of their party post-election. Post uh, again, it's, it's often overlooked, when people overlook the Liberals because they're a, a third party in British politics, that they are the most ideologically divided party of the main three. I mean, um, of course we know and we've received an awful lot of media time and, and ink has been spent on the Orange Book, uh, Laws and Clegg and, 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 and Davy, and if you want to put him in, sometimes in the cable, sometimes in cable, seems he's on the left, sometimes on the right. But this kind of Manchester liberalism, economic liberalism, smaller state, free market liberalism, you know, which is dominant at the top of the party, which really does not resonate with that many card-carrying liberal activists. But in certain parts of the country, and I'll come back to this point, there is a, a kind of a leaner, tougher liberalism uh, amongst certain parties. Uh, they tend to be, they tend to be um, in the more traditional liberal strongholds, which are neither uh, SVP liberals, uh, nor kind of a left liberalism that you find in London and in urban areas such as Manchester and other places like that. Of course, you have then the uh, traditional liberal left, uh, the, the liberalism of Keynes and Beveridge, and you also have the kind of the SDP impact. Now, you might say, gosh, that was a long time ago, but there's still a number of people who would regard themselves in that tradition, uh, which is almost like a, a kind of a moderate social democratic position. So, well, why is this relevant? Well, it's relevant for one reason. The Liberal Democrats do not have a united vision of political economy, of British political economy. They do not have a united view about the state and the market. It's a very simple point, but it's the point that is at the heart of British politics. British politics is uh, essentially about uh, the distribution of resources, like Western politics all around the world, but how much state and how much market. And the Liberal Democrats don't agree on this. They don't agree on this at conference. They don't agree on this uh, within the leadership of their party. It just so happens at the moment that the Orange Group liberals, if you want to call them that, even more Manchester liberals, economic liberals, tend to hold, hold the power. They do not hold the conscience of this party. So I think that's an interesting point. Well, what does then? Well, I've just put it in my briefing. I, I think there are five things. You could have one more, which I'll come to, but I think the civil, civil liberties, social liberalism, environmentalism, constitutional reformism, and pro Europeanism, these are the things that knit, that knit people together as liberals. And actually, often, in some senses, define, define people and, and, and the reasons why you might not join the Labour Party as well, which tend to be more conservative on certain aspects of the thing. Uh, you, what you could throw in there is also the Liberals tend to have a commitment to multilateralism and international institutions. Don't really think that's ever going to be a big thing in deciding which general elections. So I think it's an important point to remember that they're quite an ideologically divided party in terms of political economy and economics. And that becomes a political problem. When your leader is, um, when, your lead, your, when your leader uh, presents a very clear agenda, and that agenda has been, I think you can characterise it as an austerity agenda, and so you have a disconnect between people who want to be uh, liberal campaigners but who find it hard to, you know, get out on the street on a Saturday morning when you you have nine hundred thousand more people in poverty, when you have, you know, um, cuts to local government, when you have uh, this whole debate about adult social care, that these liberal foot soldiers are finding it hard to get motivated. Couple that with the fact that Labour had a huge transfer of former Labour members who left uh, during the new Labour era and then came back to Labour, and then you start piecing together um, some of the problems that the Liberals have. I think in terms of an electoral offering, they can trumpet some modest achievements 
the raising of the tax free allowance, I think that's been popular and, and widely regarded as sensible. I put the increase in wind farms, and I think where I, I live in Yorkshire and I teach to Hull, I live near York, and the proliferation of, of, of wind farms, I think, chimes not only with an environmental agenda that the Liberals have, but also an agenda of actually you know, trying to get things that are, that are built in and around Britain. We've got a, a plant at Bruff that's manufacturing these things, and I'm not sure people in London might think they're all good deal, but manufacturing in, 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 in parts of Yorkshire is immensely important, and it's indicative. I think of a narrative that liberals can say that actually we're trying to, you know, push for development that is not just sustainable, but it's also green, and it's they're providing jobs for British firms. Uh, I think the other thing that is notable is fixed-term parliaments ain't going to win you any elections, of course, but it's the sort of thing that if you're a liberal and you're into that kind of thing, you can point out, well, we have something, uh, you know, we have, and the labelism act, which of course is also conservative, <coughs> sculpted, but this notion of localism is is, is very is, is central. To the nation, their narrative can be that they are a serious party in government. They've been in government for three years. They're going to be in government for five years. I don't think it's, there's always the X factor. I don't think the coalition will implode. I think Cameron and Clegg's, Cameron and Clegg's uh, future is too finely uh, knitted together. It's too wedded. I don't think. And there's always an X factor. You never say never, but I think it will go the distance. So they can say that a vote for the Liberals is not a wasted vote, whereas they could never say that in the post war era. Uh, particularly because the electoral system biases against them, biases against the five to six million people that vote for liberals, vote for liberal at every general election. Um, and I think they can also say, but I don't think this is persuasive, that they have had a stabilising effect on the more harsh free market tendencies of the Conservative. So my, ver my verdict for the liberals is that this, whilst there are things that they can trumpet as modest victories, it's an immensely difficult narrative to sell not just to their supporters, who are feeling really rather glum, uh, but also to the nation. Um, I, I, think, I think, you know, not just the tuition fees, which will haunt them in key constituencies where young people, people under 25, have been key foot soldiers. Uh, I, I think, and I think, I'd watch Hallam. I would be watching Sheffield Hallam very interestingly as a constituency. I, you know, I just, I just got a sense that there might be a, a real motivation, you know, to get like, kind of, <coughs> Uh, campaign. The botched AV referendum, which the Liberals did not want AV, they didn't want it at the time. That was a strategic error from the leadership. It was never on anything that part as well, but that's not my group today. But I think the two things are just the, the bare naked figures of 900,000 people have been forced below the poverty line since 2010. Now, if your heartbeat does beat to the left as a party, well, then that's the data point you're going to find hard to refute. And along with that, um, their notion of fairness, which they claim to be at the core of their party, and it's whose fairness, it's a question I'd ask. Uh, that doesn't sit well with presiding over the most austere uh, economic package that we've experienced in more than a generation. So I think the future uh, is not bright, but it might be orange in terms of liberals, in terms of labour, I'm conscious of time. Um, I, I would agree that. Ed Miliband's leadership continues to be under sustained pressure inside and outside of, of the parliamentary party. Yes, due to unfavorable polling numbers, but I think very much due to a lack of a breakthrough moment. There's not been a breakthrough moment. There's been good performances on Murdoch, on Leverson, and on Arbutin, depending on where you sit, depending on where you stand with the Syria debate, but notable competent performances at the dispatch box. But um, I don't think he's had a breakthrough moment. I don't think he. He's still searching for his political voice. Um, the One Nation tag, One Nation Labour tag, may come back again at this, at this, at this uh, party conference season. But that tag is difficult. That tag is a very good tag to have in an era where you are trying to make the claim that the, the government is not working to the benefits of the whole community. And so you need a One Nation kind of uh, voice to bring everyone together to sort of try and distribute the benefits of growth and try and get growth. If the economy continues to grow, and I must admit, I'm a deep skeptic, I don't think that 0 0.7, 0 0.8 is anything to write him about. Most economists would say, you might say, well, he's going to trust the economists. Uh, but most economists would say that unless you kind of got growth of 2%, okay, and, and, and we're looking at, you know, uh, not 2% from where we are now. Because it's very easy to go, to go from one bin to two bins. <laughs> but, but relatively speaking, you need to stay, sustain growth, uh, I think, at 2% uh, 
to show that uh, the quarter on quarter, to show that the economy is back. And also, you've got to ask the question, what, what sector of the economy, what sector of the economy is there growth? The reason why these last figures have been positive for the Chancellor is because it's been in manufacturing, thus export growth, as opposed to debt fueled consumer growth, where you might have a sense of spending, but spending that is, is on the never never that most of us can't afford, yet we're doing it anyway because, hey, last summer it was the Olympics and things are pretty bleak and we want to sort of make ourselves feel better, which has tended to be an Anglo Saxon response. To recessions in recent years. It's been personal spending that's generated out of it. It's not been savings recovered or, or export recovered. So this last set of stats has been good for the Chancellor because there's been export recovered, recovery. But I don't believe there's been a full recovery. So the one nation tag is a hard thing to sell if the economy continues to track up, but that's a big if. If it doesn't, he still, he being Ed Miliband, still needs an ideological narrative. And there is not an ideological narrative. The reason there's not an ideological narrative is because it's quite hard, I think, for, for, for the Labour leadership to discern what its strategy is at the next election. Um, the strategy <coughs> was going to be cuts uh, have been too austere, you've removed demand from the economy, that removal of demand has made more people unemployed, therefore the, ta the, the benefits bill has gone up and people are poorer. Now that was a logical, systematic, Keynesian argument. It necessarily follows. If you remove demand from the economy, you make a huge amount of people unemployed, especially in the public sector. But not just the public sector, also the private sector, uh, service aspect of the private sector that provides suits and shoes and sandwiches <coughs> and what to, to the, a large public sector uh, uh, group of workers, for example. And so you, you, you remove demand Wages, uh, sorry, uh, taxes have gone down, benefits have gone, benefits have gone up, and more people have fallen into poverty. Now that is a fairly clear systematic argument. If the economy tracks up, it's hard to make that argument. So that's why I don't think they, that they know then the ideological narrative, because they don't have a strategy, and they're concerned that it just is, a, is a recovery, and I'm not convinced it is, uh, they can't have, a, they can't settle on a strategy. And that's why this conference is going to be difficult. But just because it's going to be difficult, it doesn't mean to say it's not important. If Ed Miliband does not park his party conference speech, I think his greatest, his greatest problem he's going to face is one of credibility. Now, you might say, well, he's already got a credibility gap. Well, I'm not sure. My personal view is the media has been quite tough in some aspects on him as a person, as opposed to judging him on what he said and how he's trying to say it. But I think this speech is crucially important to start to build an ideological narrative. The other thing I think is crucial for the Labour Party, we now in May next year, so that's within a year to go of the election from May, they have to flesh out policies on immigration, on welfare, on housing. I think housing, immigration, and welfare, as well as the economy, are central. Um, they have to start, I don't think you can release a manifesto even 12 months before an election because you'll be shot down. It won't just be shot down by one shotgun, it'll be two shotguns. Because this is quite uh, historic. Labour are fighting against their two main rivals. And so if there's any degree of coordination in terms of uh, the Tories and the Liberals and how they're going to try and neuter Labour's attack, it would be to sort of like pip off certain proposals. So if they let their proposals too soon, I think um, you know, the, the coalition will shoot their fox. So but nonetheless, without a manifesto, you need to have more than just a nod in the direction. You need to have clear policy proposals on immigration, on welfare, on jobs, and on the economy. And it's immensely difficult because the economy is, you know, is not static, it's fluid, but this is, a, this is the job they have to do. Um, so, what's their electoral offering? I think they can have something strong to say uh, and get about uh, the negative impact of things like underemployment. The Chancellor's trumpeted the, the million new private sector jobs. Well, there have been a million new private sector jobs, it's absolutely right, but these jobs are often unstable. Zero hours contract, there's massive underemployment, and I think that, that there is a narrative there about we're not all in it together. My personal verdict, and I'll finish on this, is that um, ultimately Ed Miliband's issue is not so much about policy right now, it's about credibility. If he can show, not just his party, I don't think he's, I don't think he's at risk, the Labour Party cautious, it does, it's not ruthless, it doesn't get rid of these leaders. Uh, very well at all, or effectively, he's safe. He, Ed Miliband has to show that he is politically credible, that he's a Prime Minister in waiting. 
It starts with a strong conference speech that can't be achieved with a conference speech. So it starts with a conference speech, and it needs to be a speech. It doesn't just inspire people to go out and campaign, but actually presents a vision uh, of a Britain, not, not, not just one that will have economic growth, but one that will also be more just. Thank you. Um, given the importance in this whole situation, we decided to have a, a serious look at the whole issue of Europe and Brexit. So first, Richard. Okay, but I'm happy to talk about Welsh politics at any point. <laughs> 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 about the recent uh, very interesting by-elections in Wales. I'm anger man. <laughs> or indeed the Norwegian elections <laughs> this week. But uh, what I want to, what I've been asked to talk about is uh, is uh, Kind of relates to what John was talking about right at the end, and I want to say a little bit about UKIP ultimately. Um, well, one hears a great deal about British Euroscepticism, it's a kind of trope which is um, a kind of constant political debate and how Europe transgresses against good old British common sense and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you know, if the if the four of us had a pound for every essay we'd marked with awkward partner in the title, we'd be extremely rich. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of a constant throw. However, I'd like to shift the focus from British Euroscepticism to Euroscepticism in Britain. Because there's some really interesting territorial and national differences within the UK in terms of attitudes to Europe, which I want to illustrate. And I, might, I will also suggest that these may actually have some political uh, repercussions looking forward in particular to next year. Um, now, Euroscepticism is a, is a kind of a portmanteau term and it's not quite clear what precisely people might mean by that. Uh, you know, voting to get out of the European Union is one measure. Attitudes towards the influence of Europe, the baleful influence of Europe is another. Propensity to vote UKIP is another kind of measure of Euroscepticism. What I want to say, my kind of core claim, is that on all of these measures, England is more Eurosceptic than the rest of Britain. And also, the English, people with a strong sense of English,